but it will likely have some aspect that has got uh, the need for blocking in it. So the most common way we see this in industry is where a company is trying to do the work and they have two operators. Two operators will do the work, one person who works Thursday, Friday, the next person will continue the work on Saturday and Sunday. So we've got two operators. Let's be very clear on the objective of our experiment. We've got two operators doing the work. The purpose of your experiment is not to test the operators. You don't have a factor in your experiment operator with a low level and a high level of science the two operators. The purpose of your experiment is to test the other factors. Operators is simply incidental. However, let's be clear that when we run an experiment, we actually anticipate different operators to have some sort of impact on the process. Perhaps, maybe not, ideally not, but the operators could have an impact on the outcome. So we've got operators that can have a potential impact on the process. We also have other factors that might have an impact on the process. As I said in the example last class, we may have different raw materials. You only have sufficient raw materials to run four experiments, and then raw materials to run the remaining four experiments. The material comes from the supplier in a quantity that's only capable of running four experiments. The purpose of the experiment today is not to test the raw material. In the future, when you use your, your product, you have to accept whichever raw materials you have. However, you simply want to avoid bias in your results by the choice of raw materials you make. Okay? So what we do is we block our experiments. Blocking is an intentional way that we try to structure our experiments so that the effect is minimal. Take a look at this diagram. This diagram indicates the way that you should run your experiments. And the diagram looks familiar. In fact, we saw this diagram several weeks ago when we started to look at fractional factorials. In that context, a few weeks ago, when I showed you this diagram, the purpose was to take the eight experiments and find only four of the eight experiments to run. Okay, that was our goal back then, to find which part of the most full set of eight experiments should we use? Our goal this time is different. Our goal is here to run all eight experiments, but our goal is to, to allocate which eight will, uh, which four of the eight will allocate to the first batch, and which four will then be allocated to the second. And that optimal arrangement is happens to coincide to be exactly the same for a good reason. Okay, so how did, how did we arrive at the closed circles? Batch one and the closing circles in batch two. Well, let's take a look here at this table layout. This table layout shows the full set of eight experiments. We're going to run all eight, and we're going to allocate batch one to all the batches where the ABC pre-factor interaction is negative. And we're going to run batch two experiments on the case where ABC is positive. Why ABC call? Why not pick minus plus minus pluses from any of the other seven models? Uh, usually there's no correlation with the ABC factors. Uh, what do you want to resolve to look for? Okay, there's no correlation with the ABC factors. Or actors. the factors that have an impact on Okay, that's, that's more in line. The ABC factor is one that we're willing to sacrifice. By choosing to run the batches according to the sites in the ABC column, essentially what I'm doing with that is I'm foregoing the ability to estimate the ABC factor interaction. If I get a significant ABC interaction later on when I do my analysis and I plot my bars and I find a very large ABC coefficient, I will not be able to tell whether the ABC really was an important factor interaction or if it was due to the effect of batch one versus batch two. Okay. So essentially that's the risk I'm taking by assigning the batches according to that. 
And it's a calculated risk because assigning the match sequencing to any of the other six columns over there, my risk is so much greater. We expect our main effects to be significant and we often expect our two factor interactions to be significant. So allocating the batch column to one of the effects that we're least interested in means we're likely to cause the less damage to our data analysis as well. Now conversely, let's say you went into this experiment knowing that the AB interaction is never important. Well, there's no physical way that A and B could interact. You could have assigned the batch allocation to that A B column. That would be perfectly acceptable. Then leaving the A B C column available to be estimated. So the choice of A B C to assign the batch is to is purely one based on our intuition that three factor interactions are not significant. So why does, why does this work? Why does choosing batch 1 to be minus and batch 2 to be plus in the ABC column, why does it prevent interference on these other six factors? I am proving that to you. I'm simply saying this is the best way to allocate it, but let's prove that those six columns will never be influenced by the batch effect. And the one way we can do that is by saying the following. Let's actually go ahead and assume that there really is an effect from the raw materials. And so when I use batch 1, the effect of Y is going to be whatever Y was plus an additional amount of G. We're going to boost Y by some amount of G. I don't know what G is. It could be a positive or negative amount. But batches that are run with batch 1, that's another rows 1, 4, 6, and 7, they're going to be artificially increased by amount of G. And the batch uh, two runs, they're going to be artificially increased by an amount of H. Okay. Now we obviously don't know G and H. These are unmeasurable. <coughs> but you can symbolically assume that they exist. And what you're saying is that it's going to be consistent. So that G is going to be the same amount of all runs, one, four, six, and seven. H is going to be the same for runs two, three, five. So now that we take a look at our calculation, and I'll show you simply the calculation for column A, when you go calculate the slope coefficient for column A, it's minus the y value in the first row, plus the y value in the second row, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. So what I've got done here is I've coded using a, a superscript tilde and a superscript circle batches from, uh, sorry, runs from batches one and two. What you'll notice then is that there's an even number of tildes and there's an even number of circles. That's expected. So one, two, three, four tildes, one, two, three, four circles. But what you'll also notice is that the sign cancellation on the tildes is exact. So here's a minus tilde, a plus tilde, a plus tilde, and a minus tilde. Indicating that if G exists and is non-zero, after you calculate that sum of eight numbers, then all the g's are going to cancel out. And all the h's will also cancel out. So even if there were a bias due to the raw materials in batch one, and even if there were a bias by an amount of h in the second batches, I'm sorry, in the runs using batch two, all those you get a, a minus g, uh, g over there, you get a plus g, you get a plus g and a minus g, the g's will cancel out. And you can go prove that for yourself for every column. It works for A, B, C, it also works on A, B, A, C, and B, C. But the one column it does not work on is the one column we actually chose our batch allocation from. If you go look at the A, B, C column, you'll get a minus tilde, a minus tilde, a minus tilde, and a minus tilde. There's no cancellation there. In fact, you get plus 4G and a minus so you get a minus 4G and a plus 4H added into the ABC term. So should G and H be non-zero, you'll bias your ABC coefficient with whatever the three-factor interaction was plus some bias. There we go. All that you'll end up with is some number, but you can't even tell whether it's due to ABC or whether it's due to Okay, so 
that's that's essentially confounding. And it works whether you're do, dealing with uh, batches of raw material, whether it's operators. There's many contexts where this occurs. Uh, if you're doing uh, popcorn experiments, you may choose to do four experiments this weekend and four experiments next weekend. Okay. Or if you're driving a car, you may choose to drive it to four, four trials for gas mileage this weekend, four trials of gas mileage next weekend. You don't want the day of the week to impact your results, right? You want your experimental results to be correct, whether they're done on a Sunday or a Tuesday or a Friday. Shouldn't matter. So you should run your experiments in a locked type manner whenever you break up your work into two chunks. Okay. Everyone clear on the two 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 blocks? Okay, let's take it now up to four blocks. In some cases you might run your experiments in such a way that you have to do two at a time. You've got eight runs, doing them two at a time, and that's four sets of runs. How do you allocate those batches, or sorry, how do you allocate those runs so that you can do them two at a time? to do the 
experiments in groups of two, so four experiments and four experiments, that's thinking that says, well, introduce a, a new factor, D, into your experiment and assign D as the product of A, B, and C. So then that way we allocate the minuses to minuses get run from batch 1 and the pluses get run from batch 2. But now I'm saying my question is, what if we have to do these experiments in groups of 2 at a time, not 4 at a time? And the suggestion then is, consider this to, as the following. Consider this the equivalent of adding two new factors, D and E. And what you're going to do is, you're going to run D and E in the usual factorial manner. So where D is a minus and E is a minus, you're actually going to run maybe on day one where D is plus and E is minus, we're going to run it on day two. Minus plus corresponds to day three, and plus plus corresponds to day three. So adding in two new factors, D and E, and using those combinations out there will help you allocate the experiments over the four days that we're going to run two experiments per day. So if that's the thinking, how should we generate factor D and factor E? From the table that's up there. So the table up there indicates that it's as if we're introducing an artificial factor D and an artificial factor E into my experiments and generate D as the product of A times B and generate E as the product of A times C. And if we do that, then D equals AB corresponds to plus, minus, minus, plus, minus times minus is plus, minus, minus, minus. And E corresponds to AC is plus, minus, 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 I'm sorry, AC is minus, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, 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 plus, Okay, so what this thing says is when you keep a lot of positive, I look up from this table over here and I say I'm going to run that experiment on day four. When that's a minus minus, I look up from this table and I'm going to run that experiment on day one. That was the former result. With the case where we were splitting it across two days. We're now splitting it across four days. Or we're breaking up our experiments into groups of two over four batches. Yes, right. If you're randomizing, there's no there's no guarantee that it, the effect will disappear. Because this is going to guarantee that those G's and H H's cancel out. It's it's more specific. It's actually it's it's like pairing your experiments so that the effect of pairing, remember when we did pairing back, back when, it causes cancellation. This is exactly the same thing. You create and, and enforce the cancellation to occur. Whereas with randomization, you're hoping the cancellation occurs. So if you go through this, uh, let's just do a few more examples. Minus plus, we look it up at this table that says corresponds to day three. Plus minus that corresponds to the day two. Okay, keep going. And that tells you how those experiments should be So you've got two experiments on day one, you pick those two experiments, the next two experiments on day two, the next two experiments on day three, and your final two.
So walking walking in a way to make sure that that effect is the case. Let's, uh, let's take a look at an example from a previous exam here. We can look at lots of examples in the past two, three weeks in class. Let's take a look at one more. Uh, this one is, is not in your notes. You can copy it down a lot. I'll post it this evening on the website. So you can so actually don't copy it down because you're just wasting time. It's a lot you spend four or five minutes working with someone around you and figuring out how you set up this experiment. So if you take a look at the first question. Because you 
six factors that's going to run eight, eight experiments. It's, it's still got a nine point to run, which we can talk about in a minute. But uh, this, the starting thought here is that we've got six factors, so it's a two to the six something factorial, minus three, that gets you eight experiments, two to the six minus three. So let's just uh, reference that up in the table. So two to the six minus three, we're in, in this. Any other thoughts on that? Everyone agree with that approach? So then adding in an additional variable for the heat for the tile that the, the soil is coming from. Okay. So let's, uh, everyone on board with that thing. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, so we've got a 2 to the 6 minus 3. A, B, and C are going to get generated in the, or written out in the usual way. I'm not going to do that. Uh, D equals A, B. C, factor uh, D is equal to A times C. F is equal to B, C. Those are easy to write out once you have A, B, A, C, and B, C written out. And then generate factor G as a product of A, B, and C. So maybe let's just take two rows. We write uh, the first two rows minus plus. So D equals A, B, that's plus. Minus E equals A, C, that's plus, minus. F is equal to B, C, that's plus, plus. And G equals A, B, C is minus plus. So this might be B1, e the pluses might correspond to B2. E A, B, C, E, E, and F represent the six other factors. So you, you write out all eight rows as that. So here's rows. Rows 1 through to 8 get written out in the usual way. What do we do about row 9? What would we set row 9 to? We've got the money to run the ninth experiment. Do you just leave the money? Tell the boss, I'd say it was the money, don't worry about it. Start a company to own money so you may not want to spend it. Run uh, another experiment to help generate confidence intervals. Okay, so that's a good reason for running the ninth experiment. Any other reasons for running the ninth experiment? What happens in real experimentation? Take 
the 50-50 mixture of, it just, it's not a variable that makes, makes sense. Now run it at zero, but how do you get a zero for a categorical variable? Okay, you can't, so you simply make an arbitrary decision for one, one way or the other. Okay, so if this is a categorical variable, you might choose a minus, or you might choose a plus, just it's an arbitrary choice. But variables that are continuous and that you can move, put them to their center points, and Categorical variables that allow you to mix stuff, you can take a 50 50 mix, but provided it's safe to do so, right? Sometimes a categorical variable uh, should not, you shouldn't mix two catalysts, for example, and not the same thing to do. So, your ninth experiment, two different ways of thinking about it. Some people like to do, use that extra experiment right at the beginning, at their center point as a way to simply iron out any problems. Like the first time you do an experiment, you realize midway you need an extra person to help take the sample. Like you've got your hands busy and you can't possibly do this. So you figure that out in the first experiment. If this experiment goes wrong and you get a garbage <coughs> result, you go, it doesn't matter. It's not required in your data analysis anyway. Okay, so you haven't wasted anything. In fact, you probably spend that money a good way to help you figure out so that the other eight are done. Another way that people sometimes consider these extra experiments is they say, well, I'm going to run my eight, especially if you're confident, right? If you've used this equipment before, there's no need for you to go waste your money on running an extra experiment. But what you can go use this data in the ninth experiment for is, let's say one of your experiments gives you kind of a really amazing or interesting answer. Right, almost to the point where it looks like it's an outlier, or it's the best point out of the eight that you've got. It's still within the range of the others, but it's the best one that you have. You might have to use your nine experiment to go run a repeat, just to make sure that that really was as good as any thought it was. Okay? So different innovative ways that you can use that nine experiment uh, for. So either at the very beginning or at the very end to double check something. So when you indicate your run order in your table there, that line experiment is usually either the very first experiment or the very last experiment with some explanation why you've chosen it at that position. Okay. Same, same here, all your thinking in this question is not just right at the table and at the end of the explain what your thinking is when you're doing this question. Okay, so let's talk about uh, uh, Redmond experiments. This is a, this is a good point to come back to the last set of slides that I've lost over. I kind of jumped around through the slides here this, this year. I won't be presenting in the order that they're in the notes. This year I've intentionally kind of done my own experiment, restructuring the material in a different way. Let's take a look back here at this topic of Redmond designs. This is on slide 16. 59 and 60 in the world. Okay, what we have here are the data for full factorial, and we know that it's a full factorial examine this problems A, C, A, B, A, C, B, C, and A, B, C, and the signs here indicated that it's a full factorial of eight experiments. But when you look at the data table, there's actually three extras. Three extra experiments were done at the center points of A, B, and C. The zero is all the way. Those ones are over there because that's by intercept. Intercept beta naught. There's always ones for the intercept column. Intercept column is never an, an exception, always a problem of one So what this does is when you calculate the degrees of freedom, n minus k, n is available in this case, k is 8, there's your 8 slope coefficient, you're going to have 3 degrees of freedom so that you can now estimate standard error. Remember the formula for standard error was sum of squares of the residuals divided by n minus k. 
n minus k is 11 minus 3, so you can actually calculate standard error. Once you have standard error, you can go calculate confidence intervals. So now the question often that people ask me and ask themselves when they're doing experiments is should you do these replicate runs or should you even run center points? What I'm presenting here for you is how you would analyze the data if you had replicate runs or center points. In fact, you, you can do this by easily in R, you simply add all your data in R. But the question that we're asking is a little more subtle, should you run replicate runs? Any thoughts on that point? Should you run replicates? Okay, a lot of it, that's a, a good point, a lot of it depends on the variability in your wide How much variation of noise do you see in your wiring? If you had to repeat the same experiment a second time, would you get a value of Y that's similar or close to the one that you got the first time? That's going to guide you in your decision on whether you should run a replicate or not. The rule of thumb that one should use is that generally you don't run replicates. If you go to run replicates, a replicate is actually really expensive. If you think of what a true replicate is, a replicate says, let's say A, B, C, D, uh, sorry, A, B, C here corresponds to uh, temperature of the oven, B corresponds to the amount of flour, and C corresponds to the amount of milk in your recipe. A replicate experiment says you go take all your ingredients, mix them up from scratch, with the same amount of flour, milk, eggs, oven temperature setting, you go do an entire extra run. So you've done your eight already, now you go to repeat an entire extra run, nine, maybe 10, 11, 12. So a replicate requires you to repeat everything from scratch exactly in the same way as you did the prior experiments. People often confuse replicates as follows. Let's take the baking example of the game. People often think a replicate might be, let's say you're measuring the right height of your muffins that you're making. If you go and take your dough that you've mixed, baked it in the oven, and you poured three or four muffins, it's not a, a replicate is not measuring the height of muffin one, muffin two, three, four. Those are not four replicates. Because those four muffins come from the same experiment from the same batch of materials. A, a true replicate is going to repeat all the work from the very beginning to the end in exactly the same way as you have done for experiment one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So replicates are actually extremely expensive in, in many cases. In some cases replicates are really cheap. And those are the two criteria that you use. The, the, cost of the replicate and the variability of noise that you anticipate. That's another reason why you'll see these three center point runs here. Those three center point runs are often used as a way to judge the noise in Y. They're, that's the usual reason for, for them being run. They get run right at the beginning to iron out experimental problems, but those three Y values that you get from those three experiments should agree well with each other. If they agree well with each other, then you simply go ahead and run these eight experiments only once. Because you've proved it to yourself conclusively that the amount of noise in the system is relatively low. So, so replicates serve a purpose, they can serve a purpose to judge noise in the system, but replicates should not be used without justification. Here's a, here's a good example of, of why I'm saying that. Let's go back to this table over here. This table is, is often going to be our frame of reference for any discussion in these terms. Take a look at comparing this, this work through the case where we're working with five factors. If I'm working with five factors over here, 
the replicate, let's say I go, go take my eight experiments over here, and I go repeat them a second time. So I take these eight experiments and I go repeat them all a second time. I've now done 16 experiments. Okay. Well, what I could have done far more efficiently, instead of eight experiments, now I'm going to 16 experiments. What I could have done by duplicating the number of experiments, I could have actually added in more factors. I could have added in more factors. The 16 experiments go on and investigate a wider variety of factors, rather than simply running replicates. Replicates do you no good in terms of increasing your knowledge of what various factors do to your process. Replicates help simply establish confidence in but the far more efficient way is to first run, if you're going to run a higher number of experiments, if you've got some budget to run them, it's rather don't spend them on pure information, rather spend them on adding factors to your experiments. Okay, so that's the general thinking. But what you'll almost certainly find is that some of these factors later on are not significant. Once you remove them out, you gain your degrees of freedom back, and then you Done, you, you recover more knowledge with the same amount of work. So replicates are a subtle issue, but it's not always a, a guarantee that we should, uh, should use them. Any, any discussion or points or questions on that? Yes, 
then that call speed will also be minus two pluses, minus minus plus plus, and then the final call is plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, corresponding to the ETS2 transaction. So if you give these eight, these four experiments to your operator to go run, but let's say for some reason your operator runs that this experiment over here. They run it as they use 408 code. Okay. And the experiment costs maybe $240,000 to run. That's why you only have four experiments. What are you going to do?